Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next in our installments of seminars throughout the day. We are absolutely delighted to be joined by Keith Gordon, Barrister at Temple Tax Chambers today, who is going to talk us through from his, his experience on IR35 cases that are recently happening, have gone before, and talk about what we can learn from them. Um, I won't say too much. Pretty much everyone on the call, I anticipate, will already know Keith um, and know of his fantastic work for contractors to date. So I will hand over to Keith to to um, introduce himself. And towards the end of the session, we'll take some questions from Keith for about 15 minutes. So if you have questions throughout the session, please feel free to use the question box on the um, drop down on your on your control panel pane and we will get to those at the end. So without further ado, I pass over to Keith to, to crack on with the presentation. Right, well, thank you very much. And I'm going to proceed on the basis that I can be heard. And if you can't hear me, no doubt someone will start shouting. I'm going to be looking at the history of IR35 cases over the last 20 years, because they effectively tell us where the battle lines are when it comes to looking at IR35 and someone's liability to tax under IR35. And although the IR35 legislation is fairly complex, all the cases, except the initial challenge made back in 2000, which we don't need to worry about, but all the cases um, that have been heard focus on one particular part of the legislation. And that is whether or not the worker in a situation where you have a worker operating through a limited company or partnership, but let's just call it a company, ultimately for a client, um, is that individual effectively an employee of the client? In other words, if you cut out that intermediary, the company or the partnership, and had the worker working in similar terms for the ultimate client directly, would the worker be an employee of the client or would the worker be self-employed in relation to their work and the client would therefore just be, in the true sense, a client. So all these cases turn on whether or not the conditions for employment status are met. Now, in order to um, understand the recent case law, it is necessary to roll the clock back 52 years um, to the first of three key cases of employment status. And they are all cases effectively involving the tax authorities or social security authorities, which are now part of the revenue. The first case which I'm going to be looking at, which was effectively the birth of the modern definition of who is an employee, is a case of ready mixed concrete. And as I said, it was heard in 1968. And there, the judge, Mr. Justice McKenna, gave effectively what is almost a statutory definition of employment status. It's not statute, it was simply a, an expression through the common law, and therefore one shouldn't necessarily treat the words too literally, but this statement has been endorsed at the highest levels by the House of Lords, the Supreme Court in subsequent cases. So it is as pretty close to statute, statutory authority as you'll ever get. And what Mr. Justice McKenna said, um, and you'll have to forgive the wording because even as late as 1968, the terminology is somewhat um, reflecting an earlier era. And you'll notice this particularly in the words um, used by Mr. Justice McKenna. A contract of service, which means an employment contract, exists if three conditions are fulfilled. One, the servant, what we might now call a worker, the servant agrees that in the consideration of a wage or other remuneration, he, and I think we have to now assume that is a she as well, he will provide his own work and skill in the performance of some service for his master. So as I said, slightly old fashioned wording, but effectively the worker has to um, provide his or her own work and skill in the performance of service for the person who is to, to be described as the employer. And that's in consideration of a wage or other remuneration. So that's number one. Number two, he agrees expressly or impliedly that in the performance of that service, he will be subject 
to the other's control, i.e. the client's control, in a sufficient degree to make that other master. And number three, the other provisions of the contract are consistent with its being a contract of service, effectively an employment contract. So we have three conditions. One, you've got to provide your own services. You can't um, prov um, promise that a service will be provided and have the right to subcontract that to someone else. So it's personal service, number one. Number two, subject to the other's control in a sufficient degree. Um, in other words, you're transferring an element of control, sufficient control to your employer. And thirdly, the other provisions are consistent with it being a contract of service. Now, one would have thought that those three terms were pretty straightforward. Um, a bit of explanation is probably helpful on each of the three. Number one, um, it's quite clear that stage one um, requires the individual to provide, um, be required to provide personal service. And there is case law making it clear that the right of subcontracting or delegation is generally the antithesis of an employment contract. So um, to be an employment contract, you must be required to provide personal service. But this test has also been interpreted by a number of cases as requiring what's known as the mutuality of obligations. In other words, there has got to be the right um, to um, demand a wage or other remuneration in exchange for which the worker will provide the work or services. So test one has been interpreted in two different ways, not necessarily inconsistently, but um, there are two tests. One, there's got to be the requirement for personal service. Secondly, there has to be some concept of mutuality of obligations. We'll be looking at that in the due course. The second point, um, control. One has to recognise that this test set out in 1968 by Ms Justice McKenna was the culmination of a number of attempts over the previous century to try to work out what makes a contract one of employment rather than not employment. And going back to the Victorian age, control was the test of employment. If you're under someone else's control, that was sufficient to make you an employee in modern terminology. But by the end of the Second World War, there were cases which were recognising that actually there are plenty of people out there who have an awful lot of control as to what they do. For example, master mariners, surgeons in top hospitals. Um, they are the ones who decide what to do. Yet they're still employees. And how can you marry the need for there to be control over you with the fact that actually you are in a better position than your employer to decide what you should do at any particular stage? So a number of tests had been had evolved by the end of the 1960s. But what Mr. Justice McKenna did was rejected those other tests, but retained control, but subject to the proviso that the control is only in a sufficient degree. In other words, there's sufficient flexibility in the test so as to allow the control test to be met when a judge considers it to be appropriate. And the third test, actually, before we go on to the third test, um, what Mr. Justice McKenna said is that there are four aspects of control. There is the what you do, the where you do it, when you do it, and how, um, how you do it. For example, if I'm um, provide, uh, I wrote an article over the weekend for a Taxation Magazine, and no one told me when to write it. Clearly, I was in control of myself as to when to write it. So that's an element of the when. The how, no one told me how to write it. Uh, I use my own style. There might be a style guide I had to follow, but on the whole, I chose how to do it. And no one told me where I should perform the work. The what was effectively what had been um, contracted, I was contracted to write, which was a particular article. Now, the reason I emphasize that these there are four different aspects of the what is that the Supreme Court in 2013, in a case involving the Catholic Church, 
has emphasized that actually over time, what has become more important is the what element. So it's not so much the where, the when, and the how. And if you think about what people have been experiencing over the last three months, um, there are a lot of jobs that people have been carrying out, not in their normal workplace, but at home. Theoretically, the employer or the client hasn't had much control as to the where the work is done, as long as the work is done. So there are different aspects of control, but what has become more important in the last 10 years is the question of what. And the final stage is the other provisions of the contract are consistent with it being a contract of service. In other words, you might have um, the requirement to do a job yourself. Um, imagine you have an actor in a West End production running for six months. The actor can't suddenly say, well, actually, I didn't fancy doing it on a particular night. I'll get my friend to um, perform the services um, for me. It's clearly a contract of personal service. And in that situation, let's assume there's also the sufficient mutuality of obligations. The actor is under an awful lot of control of the um, theatre company or the director, because the actor can't choose what to say or when to say it or where to say it. And in many cases, can't even control how to say it. They are effectively a mouthpiece for the director. So it's quite clear that an actor in that situation will be caught by the first of two of the tests in ready mixed concrete. But um, we then come to the third stage. The other provisions of the contract are consistent with it being a contract of service. And this is where one takes, effectively applies a reality check. Um, we'll look at the wording of this shortly in a bit more detail, but the general consensus is this third stage is a reality check and when you have an actor who is clearly carrying on a profession as a self-employed actor um, that's the fact that you might have for six months of his or her life a particular engagement in which there is an awful lot of control over that person taking that step back and applying common sense will show that the other provisions of the contract are not consistent with it being a contract of service and therefore is merely a particular incident in the actor's self-employment. Anyway, that's the test in ready mixed concrete um, and that is and should be the starting point whenever one is looking at employment status. Now, the year after ready mixed concrete was heard, there was another case also involving the Minister of Social Security. It's a case of market investigations. And this was looking at the employment status of casual staff who were um, conducting surveys on the street. So someone with a clipboard standing on the street was engaged by an organization known as Market Investigations Limited. And the question was whether or not those workers were employees and therefore liable for a particular form of cash insurance, or whether or not they were self-employed carrying on their trade. Now, the most important point about this case is not the conclusion of the court in the case, but part of its analysis. Because the analysis um, said, um, in order to find out whether someone is in business on their account, and being in business on your account is effectively being self-employed and therefore the flip side of being an employee, um, in order to um, consider whether someone is in business on their own account, you cannot come up with a finite checklist that is appropriate for all situations. Nevertheless, there were some pointers, some factors that the court ought to, thought would be relevant in many cases. And there were about half a dozen such factors, such as the element of financial risk, um, as to whether or not you were an, an employee or not. Now, it's quite interesting that every case I have seen which refers to market investigations, makes, it makes the point that this is not, there's not a checklist. You shouldn't apply a checklist. You should actually consider the overall picture. Nevertheless, every case, and I'm as guilty as everyone else is in this regard, everyone um, does then try to apply the six items identified by Mr. Justice Cook in that case, just to reinforce their arguments. Now, obviously, if those arguments um, aren't particularly, if 
those six pointers do not help your argument, then you say, well, of course, it's irrelevant in this particular case. But on the whole, you can usually make a fairly good argument based upon the factors there, but you obviously have to caveat it with the provision that obviously this is not a checklist and this is just um, pointers that you might wish to consider. Now, um, I'm then going to jump from 1969 through um, to 1994, so 25 years later, and we have a probably what I would now say is the first of the very recent, or the first of the very modern case, it's not totally recent, it's only 26 years old, this is a case of Hall and Lorimer. And this is the case that the revenue do, do not like. Mr. Lorimer was a vision mixer. Now, I had no idea what a vision mixer was until I read this case, but a vision mixer is someone who works in a TV studio, has a number of screens in front of him or her, and effectively chooses which screen um, or which image is seen by the viewers at home. So each screen is um, connected to a ca camera, um, not necessarily directly, but effectively each screen relates to what one camera sees, and the vision mixer then chooses what the viewer at home will see. Now, this is an example of someone who did not provide his own equipment for the job, because clearly this was highly expensive equipment which would be found in the studios in which he was working. And it also, and the courts also said that the checklist devised by Mr. Justice Cook in Musk Investigations is not particularly useful for people who are providing their professional services. There's a difference between someone who is driving a lorry, for example, which was the facts behind the ready mix concrete case, and someone like a vision mixer who is providing a professional service. And um, again, when one is applying the checklist or looking at the checklist in market investigations, a further caveat is, well, it doesn't really apply in my case because I'm providing a professional service. Um, this is more um, looking at different kinds of work. So one of the issues was, to what extent do you provide your own equipment? Well, Mr. Lorimer didn't, but it didn't really matter. Now, the key thing about Mr. Lorimer's case is that Mr. Lorimer had a series of different clients and his individual engagements lasted perhaps one or two days. So he was never out in a particular, on a particular assignment for very long. He had a series of clients and therefore, when looking at the overall picture, it was quite clear that the overall picture was inconsistent with it being a contract of service. It could not realistically be a series of very short employments, one day, two days duration, but each engagement was an incident in a consistent pattern of working as a self-employed individual with a number of clients. But the most important part of the Hall and Lorimer case is a statement which was found in the High Court decision but was endorsed um, explicitly in the Court of Appeal. And that is that in order to find out when someone is carrying on um, a business on their own account, what one has to do is to draw an image of all the details of the fact. Now, the different weighting to give or to use the analogy of art the different shading that one gives to these details will have to be a matter to be applied by a court on the facts before it. But um, when you've drawn the picture, you then step back and look at the overall picture that you have drawn. And that overall picture is, um, will help tell you whether you're employed or self-employed. Now, the way I've argued this case, um, not the, um, that principle in, sub, in these cases, is that effectively um, looking at the stage three of ready mixed concrete. So when looking at the provisions of the contract, you step back and you draw that picture just to have that reality check. And yeah, part of that drawing that picture is to look at the issues identified by Mr. Justice Cook in market investigations, remembering it's not a finite checklist, but it's a good aid memoir for many cases. And you apply that overall picture. But if you haven't got the first or the second of the ready mix concrete test, i.e. you haven't got the requirement for personal service, or there isn't adequate control, then you don't need to get to that third stage. Because remember what's said in ready mix concrete, 
you need three conditions to be fulfilled. So once you've found that an earlier condition is not fulfilled, you don't need to move to step two or to step three as appropriate. Now, as far as I'm concerned, um, the definition of employee is fairly easy to state. I would simply rely upon what was said in Ready Mix Concrete with a few nuanced changes. Obviously, it is very difficult to apply this test on a case by case basis. You certainly cannot go on the basis of blanket assessments. And anyone who suggests otherwise is being lazy or disingenuous. But despite what I think is a fairly straightforward set of provisions, there is still a considerable amount of confusion. Now, part of that confusion is caused by HM Revenue and Customs because they are trying to reinterpret these very clear rules. We'll look at that again shortly. But even judges are sometimes getting it wrong. Now, to the defence of the judges, um, judges, even tax judges, cannot be considered to be expert in every area of the law. And they are, to a large extent, dependent on the arguments put before them and whether or not the judge, him or herself, recognises that actually there's a slightly different flaw. So before I come on to the very recent IR35 cases, I need to highlight a case of now three years old called Dylan and Dylan. And this was a partnership who provided um, or operated a haulage business. They had lorry drivers whom they engaged. And the question again was whether or not these lorry drivers were employees of the partnership or whether they were self-employed contractors. Now, these, the, when I saw that this was a case involving lorry drivers, and for those of you who have actually read tax cases, you'll often know that the result is um, included right at the top page of the decision. So you know which way the judge is going to go if you don't know how the judge is going to get there. I saw that the um, lorry drivers were considered to be employees. Now, being the tax and employment law geek I am, I was quite excited because I thought, ah, we've got the very leading case of ready mix concrete involving lorry drivers, where the lorry drivers were held to be self-employed. And we've now got another case also involving lorry drivers where they're held to be employees. So I thought, well, this is a great case to lecture about because I can effectively show the distinction between these two cases. Because um, ultimately, these cases turn on the individual facts and um, it's important to work out which facts are which and how a case was decided. The problem was, when I read the facts of Dylan, I realised that the facts were more or less identical to ready mix concrete. And in fact, it's my honest view that Dylan and Dylan was decided incorrectly. In other words, the judge just got it wrong. Now, what was the key fact that allowed um, Ready Mix Concrete to win its case? It was the fact that the lorry drivers were not actually obliged to drive the lorries themselves. They contracted to provide a particular journey, but they had the right to subcontract that task to another lorry driver. Now, whether you needed a special license in those days, um, it's irrelevant, but as long as you've got someone who else can, who can do the job for you, that means there is no personal service, and that's why Ready Mix Concrete won its case. But when reading the facts of Dylan and Dylan, it was quite clear that <coughs> the lorry drivers there were not obliged to provide the services themselves, and there was a clear finding of fact to that effect. So, as a result, it is my view that Dylan and Dylan was wrongly decided. But how did the judge overlook that fundamental fact when analysing the case? And the judge had gone through all the case law, had gone through ready mix concrete, had gone through market investigations, had gone through Hall and Irma. So, had the judge applied it logically, the judge would have reached the conclusion that these people were not employees because they were not contracted to provide their own personal service. 
Unfortunately, this is a case of where the judge just got confused. What the judge did was summarize the law as I've read out from ready mix concrete, summarize the law as I paraphrase in market investigations, and summarize the law from Hall and Lorimer involving the picture. Now, what the judge then did was said, didn't realize that there were certain hurdles that had to be met, such as personal service, such as control, etc. The judge was heavily focused on the most recent of all these cases, which was then Hall and Lorimer, 1994, and Court of Appeal Authority, and the idea that it paints the picture. And the judge said, look, these guys don't look as if they're running on a business. They're sort of dependent on one con client, i.e. the partnership, and they don't provide the lawyers, et cetera. They're providing their own labor. Now, frankly, that looks like the provision of an employee's services to an employer. And I can readily understand why, when looking at the overall picture, these workers look like employees. As I said, the problem was the judge had overlooked the fact that these employees needed to provide their personal service. And indeed, I've often lectured to professional audiences about the ready-mix case. I have read out the facts of the case and got my audience to say whether or not they think these workers were employees or self-employed. And I usually get a 95% success rate in getting people to say that they were employees, contrary to the decision of the case. And the reason I have managed to persuade people that um, these workers should be categorized as employees is because I have constantly missed out that crucial fact that the workers were not required to provide their own personal service. And it's if you just overlook that one fundamental fact, you will get the picture is very, very different. So whilst it's um, excusable that judges sometimes make mistakes on this, um, I do believe that the revenue, on the other hand, should know better. They, they are the experts, but what they do is they just interpret the law in the way that suits their views and what outcome they want. So now let's come on to the um, first of the recent series of IR35 cases. This is the case of Krista Ackroyd Media Limited, and that was heard by the um, first tier tribunal, or the uh, decision was given by the first tier tribunal at the beginning of 2018, and it was upheld on slightly different grounds by the upper tribunal in 2019. Now, <clears throat> when this case came about, so as I said, it was early 2018, I was at the time working on the Lorraine Kelly case. No one knew that the Lorraine Kelly case was going ahead, but I was working on it. And all, we, all of a sudden, we had this adverse decision, the first of these cases involving TV celebrities, and out there, which the revenue was then going to present saying, well, this proves that all these TV celebrities are really um, effectively quasi employees and should be caught by IR35. Now, it is my personal belief that the revenue arranged for the Krista Ackroyd case to be the first of these cases. They wanted the one which was most promising to them to be heard first because it would effectively sour the um, impact of, or when other cases came along, effectively, um, they'd have to somehow show that they were different from this first case. As it happens, they weren't very different from this case. But um, I don't think the revenue quite realized, or if they did realize, they were trying to avoid realizing why Chris Ackroyd was such an extreme case and why um, it was not necessarily the best case to run first. Now, I don't know um, where many of you are based, but um, for those of you based in Yorkshire, you'd be familiar with um, Krista Ackroyd um, and as a presenter of a BBC Yorkshire programme known as Look North. And she had a contract through her limited company in which she was effectively engaged on a seven year deal. Now, I have never seen in any of these other cases a contract for as long as seven years. So when looking at the overall picture, you can certainly see this was far closer to one of an employment than um, someone on a shorter term contract. Now there are cases where you've got someone 
for providing their services on a day-by-day -day basis. And you've also got cases such as Lorraine Kelly, where they're providing services on a two-year contract. Seven years is clearly at the far end of the spectrum. Now, the way the revenue have argued all these cases involving um, TV celebrities is they've looked at the contracts and the contracts are more or less identical in all these cases, um, as far as the main provisions are concerned. And one of the main provisions is that the BBC in Krista Ackroyd's case, ITV in Lorraine Kelly's case, and the broadcasters in general, um, they retain editorial control. In other words, doesn't matter how much or how little autonomy the worker has um, in front of the camera or behind the microphone, but or in front of the microphone, but ultimately it's the broadcaster, the person who owns all the equipment, who ultimately decides what goes out. And the revenue have said that editorial control is that control that is necessary for the second part of the ready mixed concrete case. Now, Chris Ackroyd worked in news and had very little control as to who she could interview, what she could say. It was much more scripted and imposed upon her. So again, another fact that um, makes her more of an employee than as someone as self-employed when looking at its overall picture. Now, in the first tier tribunal, the tribunal was very much keen on the idea that editorial control amounted to control and therefore um, ticked the second box. And then when you look at the overall picture, Chris Ackroyd was clearly um, didn't look much like a self-employed individual. And the revenue were probably deliberately going down that route because they wanted this finding that editorial control meant control because it meant they would be able to sweep up absolutely every other broadcaster's case or virtually every other broadcaster's case. But as I said, editorial control ultimately fell to the um, broadcaster rather than the presenter. However, I take the view, and there is support of that in subsequent cases, I take the view that editorial control doesn't mean the what, it is the how, because the what is effectively, you are providing your services to present this program, and we'll come into more detail on that. But how do you do it? Well, that is up to your editor. Your editor, to a greater or lesser extent, can choose which interviews are going to be run, the running order. You might have a big say in it, and Lorraine Kelly had an awful lot of say in the, her case, but that ultimately turns on the how. Um, if you imagine a taxi driver, the what is being taken from the station to the recording studio. The how is whether the driver goes at 21 miles an hour, or 25 miles an hour. Um, you might think you've got some say on that, but ultimately this, um, what um, the BBC by retaining editorial control is they only controlled the how, not the what. The what was effectively what you were contracting to do, not how you're planning to do it. So I think the revenue has over-egged the editorial control test. Indeed, if we look at the Lorraine Kelly case, the tribunal held that ITV held, had editorial control over Lorraine Kelly, but the control test was not met. So what the first year tribunal was clearly showing is that the editorial control does not satisfy the control test as far as ready mixed concrete is concerned, and therefore one should look elsewhere. So what is the what? And for this purpose, I say, well, it's effectively, what, have you, what are you able to provide? Or what are you being required to provide? In the best way of describing this is by looking to see what Krista Ackroyd had committed herself to provide. And her contract said that on 200 and however many days it was in the year, she would provide her own services to the BBC for whatever the BBC thought fit. In other words, whilst she might in her mind have thought that she was contracting to provide her services for Look North, 
the contract made it clear that if Look North came off the air, the BBC still had the right to engage and require Chris Ackroyd to turn up and provide services on another day. So, and in fact, even if Look North was still on air, they didn't have to um, engage Krista Ackroyd to provide, present Look North on a particular day. They could get her to read the news, to read the weather, to present Strictly Come Dancing. She had, all she could do was to say, yes, I will present my, provide my services for the BBC's output. In other words, the BBC controlled what she could do. She was at the mercy of the BBC to provide her services. So again, that looks like an employee. Whereas Lorraine Kelly and virtually every other individual um, I've seen in these cases has been engaged for a particular task to present a particular programme. Might just be, might be on one occasion or it might be over an extended period of up to two years. But ultimately, you have been con um, Lorraine Kelly, for example, has been contracted to provide her services on a programme. She's been asked to present a programme. Now, that is something that she was entitled to be to negotiate, and she agreed to present her services for a programme. But it meant, and there was clear evidence that this is what happened as well, which always helps, not necessarily to you don't need the evidence that it happens, but it's always helpful that it can happen. Um, if ITV wanted her to present a different programme, then they had to ask and enter into a separate contract. They couldn't just simply redeploy her to another part of the ITV's output. So on these cases, I think the revenue has been arguing the wrong approach so far as control is concerned. There is a distinction between providing control um, under the control um, that you can be deployed on any thing your employer or your client wants you to do, or being under the control where effectively um, all they can do is um, tell you how to do the particular task you've been contracted to provide. So if you're an IT contractor um, and you've been asked to, you, know, you have to forgive my ignorance um, and the way these work, but if you have been asked to implement um, or um, devise software to allow a particular um, task to be automated, that is what you have been asked to do. Um, you've agreed to provide that service. You cannot be asked, oh, by the way, could you um, work on another job as well? Because your client hasn't effectively, you haven't allowed your client to control you in that way. They would need to enter into a separate contract. If, however, you provide yourself on the terms of, I'll make myself available nine to five, five days a week to do whatever tasks the um, employer asks me to do, even if it's limited to IT work, for example, then I, I take the view that you're probably more likely to be exposing yourself to control because the what is being dictated by someone else. Now, it suggested to me some time ago that there is um, a difference between um, a lot of IT tasks are divided into subtasks. And clearly, you, um, you have to be careful as to what is the what and what is a how. But um, I think one has to take the view that the revenue looks at the wrong what. Um, I've talked about Albertel already. Um, Albertel was an emphatic victory for the taxpayer and one of the few cases which the revenue are not appealing against when even though they've lost it. Um, as I said, she was not under ITV's control even though editorial control was held by ITV. Uh, it clearly helped the fact that she did have an awful lot of say as to how her show was run. <laughs> I don't think that is necessary, but it's certainly helpful. Um, furthermore, what um, the um, first tier tribunal held was when we step back and look at the overall picture, even though we don't need to do so because um, the control test isn't met, um, 
that it's clearly um, Lorraine Kelly was a self-employed individual acting in the media because she had so much other work. Um, and it was also helpful that she was doing work for rival broadcasters. <coughs> she wasn't simply um, tied to ITV. Whereas the newsreaders in particular tend to be a lot more loyal to BBC. And that, that it doesn't mean that their cases are it's fatal to their cases, but it's certainly going to make it harder. But now again, if you can show that the BBC is a loyal and frequent customer with a number of different gigs, then why do you need to go to ITV if you can get enough work from one particular source? Doesn't mean that it is an employer. Um, the Apple House Productions case is a case which the revenue are taking to the upper tribunal later this year, but this was the case involving Kay Adams. And Kay Adams um, was generally or is generally known as a participant and panelist on Loose Women. But this case relates to her work on BBC Scotland, a radio programme. <clears throat> now, it's probably unhelpful to the revenue that um, she was known for another programme, not even connected with the BBC. But leave that aside. The revenue um, took this case. She won it on the basis of the overall picture. Now, there's one sort of question mark I'd have. I, I don't think the decision was wrong in any sense. But there was one part of the decision which is just slightly curious. It's not 100% clear whether or not the tribunal went through the three stages of ready mixed concrete. Clearly, she was the, her contract required to provide her own personal service, and I'll also assume for these purposes that um, the um, mutuality of obligations was met. Um, but it wasn't clear to what extent control was decided because there were a number of issues relating to control in the decision. I think editorial control was held by BBC Scotland, but equally there were aspects of control that Kay Adams had because she had the control over the direction of the programme generally. But then the decision said, well, even if the control test is met, the other provisions of the contract are inconsistent with it being contract of service. In other words, when taking a view of the overall picture, the tribunal held that the pic overall picture was not sat um, was not one of an employment. Now, the revenue are appealing against that, and I'll explain why in a few moments. But I think um, it's in tribunal decision that they'd already said that the control test was not satisfied and therefore you didn't need to get to this third stage. But nevertheless, um, the revenue um, are working on the basis that you are at the third stage and they'll say, well, the other provisions of the contract are inconsistent. Now, one of the main objections made by the revenue is that um, they looked at the contract and the contract did not provide for any form of holiday pay, statutory sick pay, um, statutory maternity pay and all those other provisions, pension allowance, all those other provisions that one would expect to see in an employment relationship. Now there are two arguments to this. The revenues approach is to be an employee you don't have to have pension provision, you don't have to have SMP etc or SSP. Effectively is there an employment relationship? If so, in a real employment situation, not one involving um, a hypothetical um, case where you've got a limited company in the middle, but in a real employment situation, well, even if those terms are not part of the contract, then at least those terms would be added because statute has intervened to say, well, even if your employer hasn't expressly provided for these provisions, statute is going to intervene to ensure that you have those rights. So the revenues argument is the absence of these um, benefits, if I can call them that, is a neutral term and shouldn't be used um, when looking at the overall picture. The argument the other way is that actually these terms are not there because the whole basis of the arrangement is one of providing services under a contract as if I were a self-employed individual. Therefore, self-employed individuals do not pay um, 
do not get holiday pay. They just simply don't work for a certain number of weeks and they don't get paid for those number of weeks. If they um, are ill, they just don't get paid. And those are the risks that are effectively borne by the self-employed. And the fact that this contract is drafted in those terms means at the very least the parties were not contemplating this to be a sort of employment contract. So as a result, I would say that um, it is a relevant factor, should be put into the picture. Clearly a court has to decide what weight to give to that picture, but in my view, it is a relevant, it is a relevant um, factor that should be taken into account. Now that is a matter that is actually being looked at by the upper tribunal in a case called Kickabout, which was argued last week and I've sent out um, YouTube videos um, discussing how the revenue will apply in that case. So, and I did that in the last few days. So we will get some clarity from the upper tribunal soon as to whether or not um, these statutory benefits that employees get automatically, even if they're not in the actual contract, whether it is a relevant factor or whether it is an irrelevant factor when looking at it. Um, but what I want to go back to is the case of um, PGMOL, which is the case Professional Game Match Officials Limited. And PGMOL is not an IL35 case, but is a case on employment status. It was heard by the upper tribunal early this year, or actually it was heard at the end of last year, but the decision was early this year. And it's a very important case on employment status. And it involves football referees, mainly in the um, lower professional leagues, but also providing also the individuals who provide their services as the fourth officials in the Premier League. Now, <clears throat> the distinction is PGMOL, which is owned by the Football League, Football Association and the Premier League, um, has its own full time staff who provide the who officiate at the Premier League matches but they have a bunch of very keen amateurs providing the services um, in the lower tier. And the question is whether these very keen amateurs who are paid for their services are, um, whether they are employees or self-employed. Now in the first tier tribunal, it was held that the there wasn't sufficient um, mutuality of obligations and there wasn't sufficient control. The upper tribunal overturned the second part of that, said there was sufficient control. However, it upheld the view that there was insufficient mutuality of obligations and therefore um, dismissed the revenues appeal because ultimately the decision of the tribunal, first year tribunal, was correct. These were not employees. So what we have in Professional Game Match Officials Limited is a very clear and important um, decision as to the status of the mutuality of obligations test, although I should add the revenue have sought and obtained permission to take the case to the Court of Appeal, so we'll get yet further guidance in future. It's worth understanding this question about mutuality of obligations. And for this purpose, we have to go back to the ready mixed case. Because remember, of the three conditions, the mutuality of obligations test has been derived from the first first part of the test, which is the servant agrees in consideration of a wage or remuneration, he will provide his own work and skill in the performance of some service for his master. Now, as I said, employment law has derived from this a mutuality of obligations test, but the revenue says um, mutuality of obligations is relevant solely for the purposes of determining whether or not a contract exists. Once you've got that, mutuality of obligations is wholly irrelevant. Um, now, in some ways, you can tr understand why the revenue come up with that, because there is a case in the Employment Appeal Tribunal from about 2003, in, um, the judge being Mr. Justice Elias, who said precisely that. But what the revenue omit in their analysis is what Mr. Justice Elias said 11 years later, by which time he was Lord Justice Elias, in which he said actually he went far too far. More importantly, as far as I'm concerned, there's Court of Appeal authority in case called Quashi um, and you know, it's Winsor and Secretary of State for, Def um, for Justice, which says a very important factor 
is whether or not you are engaged on a series of independent contracts or whether or not there is a um, whether you're effectively on a contract which is um, indefinite in length. Now, what the Court of Appeal says is that it's a relevant factor. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's a relevant factor at stage one. I don't think it necessarily is a state factor at stage one. It is a factor at stage three when drawing the overall picture. There is clearly a distinction between someone who has to renew, is engaged for one day at a time, um, as in Mr. Lorimer, or someone who was engaged for a seven-year contract, such as Ms. Ackroyd. So I take the view that the mutuality of obligations is a relevant factor when looking at the overall picture. The revenue, however, um, have made it... Now, actually, I'll deal with PGMOL first. What was particularly interesting in that case is that even assuming a kickoff at 3, 3 p.m., the referees could technically back out at five to three. I'm not sure what would happen to the match if that had happened, but strictly speaking, the referees were not obliged, having accepted an assignment, actually to go through with it. Equally, whilst the referee was driving up the M1 to get to a particular match, the FA could phone them up and say, actually, we don't want you officiating at this match. <clears throat> so there was no uh, mutuality of obligations because until the match actually started, the um, either side could actually withdraw from it. Now, that was a particularly extreme fact. In Kickabout, which involves a radio presenter, um, I take the view that the mutuality of obligations is a relevant factor, but it's clearly not in a situation where the presenter could decide 10 to 12 at lunchtime to say, actually, I don't fancy presenting this programme this afternoon. I'm going to go home. So, the facts are different, but I think the principle is the same, that mutuality of obligations is a relevant factor. Um, there have been a couple of cases involving IT contractors which are conflicting. One involving RELC Consulting Limited, where the contractor was held to have a series of professional clients and was therefore, I-35 didn't apply. But there was one called Northern Light Solutions, where the worker was held to be a pseudo-employee, effectively I-35 did apply. I'm of the view that Northern Lights was wrongly decided. And again, it was a case of the judge just not quite understanding the nuances of the law. Now, I noticed that it's now five to two. So I think rather than me just, oh, actually, I will finish one point. Red, White and Green Limited, which is a case involving Eamon Holmes, I think has been wrongly decided. And I think what the judge has done is looked too much at the facts of a particular contract, the contract with ITV for the presenter representing um, Good Morning Britain. Um, I think that um, the judge has forgotten to step back and look at the overall picture, but I believe that case might be going on appeal next year. Right, it's now still five to two, so I will um, end now and take any questions that um, might be there. I haven't seen whether there are any in the chat. Uh, thank you very much, Keith. That was a fantastic, fantastic presentation, um, as always. There are a couple of questions. Um, relatively brief ones, but would value your opinion on them. First one is, what can PSCs do when clients are making blanket bans on PSCs? Screen. Yeah. Um, this is just one, what I find the unfairest part of the post-2017 and the post-2021 rules is effectively the revenue have forced there to be a battle between um, the two contracting parties and the revenue just pick up the pieces like vultures after the event. Um, my understanding is just scream and scream and scream. I think ultimately your only right in law is then to sue your client, which is not necessarily the most appealing proposition. Um, saying what it made you'll deduct I'm entitled to X, you're not entitled to deduct Y. Um, that is possibly not the most attractive proposition. I think the only other option you can do is to take the uh, cash flow downsides on the chin, but then 
put, put in your tax returns on the basis that you think are correct. Now, depending on how compliant your employer stroke client is, you might be able to go to court and say, we've got this ob obligation. Um, and you can almost do it as a friendly um, way rather than really suing them for the money and saying, get a declaration for, for court to say what the actual tax treatment is so that the every, all the parties can then proceed with a sanction of the court. Um, that is potentially expensive, but um, I don't think the revenue is keen to um, make life easy for contractors or their clients. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, obviously that's an incredibly practical way of trying to obtain it, but I, I do think you're absolutely right from my perspective is just have those discussions with the end clients. We, we previously to this session did a session on blanket banning and PSCs and, and explored how contractors can be speaking with their end clients. But blanket determination is very different to blanket banning um, and, and clearly both have their own commercial problems, economic problems and compliance problems. But I really do strongly think that that blanket banning is hugely detrimental to the end client hugely detrimental to the supply chain. So from from my view, where possible, getting in front of the end client, getting in front of the agency as early on as possible is um, is, is is really the, the, the first port of call. Um, and as I say, as Keith says, the game is largely down uh, because it's an important point. Okay, um, next question. Do pension auto enrollment rule, uh, rules apply retrospectively in the case where found to have been an employee? My, the correct answer is I don't know, but my very educated guess is the whole flaw of IR35 is that you are paying, having all the downsides of being an employee without any of the benefits. So my guess is that auto enrollment will not apply because my guess is that auto enrollment applies only to real employees rather than deemed ones under the IR35 tests. I think I, I think I would support that view. I mean, I, I think this is deemed employee for the purposes of tax um, and and therefore I, I wouldn't expect those employment rules to be to be applied, as you say. Um, I don't know about Tom, you want to add anything to that? <laughs> I, I can only say that I agree with, with both yourself and Keith. Um, being deemed an employee for tax purposes um, doesn't necessarily give you the rights of an employee for employment law purposes. I think that's the big, big problem with IR35 and one that the government, despite being asked to look at um, in the, the Good Work report, uh, has failed to do so. It's worth remembering the original press release back in 1999 and all the um, public announcements at then is what they were objecting to were workers being forced into companies and the two examples I remember hearing about at the time were doctors receptionists limited and train drivers limited so people who are clearly employees being channeled into a tax efficient arrangement um, so oh, okay tax is lost but more importantly, these workers are therefore denied the right that employment law properly confers onto them. And you can understand that this legislation is there to scare people off the grass and not take liberties. And I don't suppose you do have doctors receptionists anymore or train drivers um, running their effectively providing their service to a limited company. So they have gone back onto the payroll and have the commensurate um, rewards or benefits of employment law. But IL35 is effectively hitting people who are, to a greater or lesser extent, self-employed individuals. And there is a boundary and it's a blurred boundary. And I think it's wrong that the legislation should effectively punish these individuals who are legitimately providing their service to a limited company and denying them the rights, um, yet having to pay for them. Yeah, absolutely agree. Okay, we'll finish off with two final questions. Um, what happens when your client's IR35 assessment using CEST comes back as undetermined? 
go to council, pay council tons of money for an opinion. <laughs> I no, think I, mean, uh, I would be surprised if it came back as as undetermined in terms in uh, post the reforms. Would you? I will not comment. Okay. Um, I think at the end of the day, if it's undetermined, reach a view, reach a sensible view. Um, and if not, go back to the answer I gave to question one. Fantastic. Uh, one final, a little bit more specific question. Um, I was engaged as an IT project manager, and during this time, I was asked to take on a series of projects, many concurrent. The whole engagement was three and a half years, although each contract extension was three to five months. Should I have had an IR35 assessment for each project? Um, we well, shouldn't have received an IR35 assessment for each project. It's effectively, would the company be subject to a determination at the end of each year on a tax year basis? But if the question is, are we, should we have been within IR35 or not? Um, my view would be generally, someone working on three to five month contracts is probably not properly within IR35. Now, obviously one has to look at all the facts of the case, but I would be tempted to think they're just simply providing their services on an ad hoc basis, even if it's a slightly extended period. It's shorter than the contract that Lorraine Kelly had. Um, it's equivalent to the contract in RALC. Um, but the um, it's also similar to the one which was unfortunate in Northern Lights. So I think I would say you'd have a fighting chance on those limited facts, obviously caveated by the fact that I don't know all the facts of the case. Equally, I could understand why the revenue might have picked on you. So should you have received one, if the revenue doing their job properly the way they like to do them, then yes, you should. Uh, if they were doing the job properly in the way I like to think they should have done their job, then you shouldn't. Fantastic. Well, that's the end of all the questions. So all that remains is for me to say thank you ever so much to Keith um, for a fantastic presentation and of course for your continued impassioned, enthusiastic contribution to the ongoing debate around this and, and certainly for holding HMRC to account at every juncture. Um, I wish everyone free. luck and keep safe. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to Keith and we um, shall hopefully speak again this afternoon. All the best. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Kate.